Hey y'all. Last episode, I shared some glitch in the matrix stories with you. Well, these stories are just so intriguing and mysterious that I want to delve deeper into this phenomena with you. This episode is part two of a two-part collection of stories. So if you haven't listened to the previous episode, I'd recommend that you do that although it is not necessary to understand these stories. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. I got a phone call from my next-door neighbor late in the evening, asking if I can help him move a mattress into his upstairs. His mom is ill and has a big, heavy sleep number bed. I of course ran over to help because they're great neighbors. I get over there and his friend, who is also a priest, was there to help. I helped them figure out how to separate the mattress from the bed so we could fit it up the stairs. We get it all moved up and back in place when my neighbor asks if I can help them move an armoire upstairs too. I think nothing of it and we pull it out of his travel trailer and start bringing it up the front stairs of his house. This is where I died. The front stairs are about 11 steps. I was on the lower end of the armoire, about six steps up, when my neighbor and his friend lose a handle, and it comes crashing down on me, and I fall backwards towards the pavement. I then wake up in my dining room to my phone ringing, and my wife asking me if I'm going to answer the phone. It's my neighbor asking me if I can help him move a bed upstairs for his mom. I go over there and I meet his priest friend again, as this has been the first time that I met him. I say I can help with the bed, but I cannot help with the armoire. My neighbor was like, how did you know about the armoire? I then proceeded to tell them that I'm pretty sure I just died. I spent the next hour talking with the priest. He had so many questions. My neighbor didn't believe it until I described the upstairs bedroom in perfect detail down to the metal mattress frame on the floor and the intricate headboard leaning against the wall, and I'd never been upstairs in their house before. The priest asked me what I saw after I died. I told him I never actually died. Before it happened, I woke up at my dining room table. So to put it into perspective, my girlfriend of two years lost her mother unexpectedly six months before her and I met. She and her mother were very close. They were practically best friends. Now it's New Year's Eve, and we're headed to her best friend's house for a party. My girlfriend decides to wear one of the last things her mother gave to her before passing away, a pair of gold earrings. At some point throughout the night, she loses an earring. Devastated, we all retrace our every step, and we do manage to find the back to it, but no earring. It's now 24 hours later. I'm lying in her bed, by myself, with no clothes on while she's in the shower. I'm reading a book when all of a sudden, the earring gets dropped onto my bare chest out of nowhere. I look around. Nobody else is in the room. Nobody else in the house. Just my girlfriend mindlessly showering in the room beside me. I do not have long hair, and I was not wearing a hat. There's absolutely zero chance it was stuck to me. For a few weeks before this, while out driving, I've observed pedestrians standing at the traffic lights who will reach into their pocket and look at their phone as they're walking across the road when the light turns green. Nothing significant or strange about this, just one of those mundane things you notice while going about your day. Today I was driving with my daughter, and we stopped at a red light at a crossing, and there was a man standing there. Nothing out of the ordinary, denim jacket, black cap, glasses, around six foot two. I thought I'd try to weird out my young daughter. Okay, she's five, so I knew I was going to blow her mind. So I say, you see that man? When the walking man goes green and he starts to walk across, he'll reach into his pocket and pull out his phone and start looking at it. Watch and see. As he walks across, he reaches into his pocket, but then immediately takes his hand out, looks and points right at me with his mouth open smiling, like, gotcha. 
Of course, my daughter found this absolutely hilarious, and I sat there completely mind blown. I must have sat there in silence looking at him walk across for the next 10 seconds. I drove on and had a look at him as I drove past, and he was smirking and laughing at me. I've been playing it through my head all day. The windows were up, the radio was on, and I wasn't shouting. My voice was not even remotely raised. He must have been about 15 or 20 feet away from me. I can't figure out at all how he could have heard me. It's literally impossible. How did he know I was trying to predict he'd reach into his pocket for his phone? The only even remote possibility I can think of is that he had the same observation as me and thought I might be thinking the same thing, so he just went for it. But realistically, what are even the chances of this? My last semester at college, I was assaulted by a football player for walking where he was trying to drive. Now, take note, he was 325 pounds. I was 120 pounds. While unconscious on the ground, I lived a different life. I met a wonderful young lady. She made my heart skip and my face red. I pursued her for months and dispatched a few jerk boyfriends before I finally won her over. After two years, we got married and almost immediately she gave me a daughter. I had a great job and my wife didn't have to work outside of the house. When my daughter was two, my wife delivered her son. My son was the joy of my life. I would walk into his room every morning before I left for work and doted on him and my daughter. One day while sitting on the couch, I noticed that the perspective of the lamp was odd. Like, inverted. It was still in 3D, but just wrong. It was a square lamp base red with gold trim on four legs and a white square shade. I was transfixed. I couldn't look away from it. I stayed up all night staring at it. The next morning, I didn't go to work. Something was just not right about that lamp. I stopped eating. I left the couch only to use the bathroom at first. And soon, I stopped that too as I wasn't eating or drinking. I stared at the lamp for three days before my wife got really worried. She had someone come and try to talk to me, but by this time, my cognizance was breaking up and my wife was freaking out. She took the kids to her mother's house just before I had my epiphany. The lamp is not real. The house is not real. My wife, my kids, none of that is real. The last 10 years of my life are not real. The lamp started to grow wider and deeper. It was still inverted dimensions. It took up my entire perspective, and all I could see was red. I heard voices, screams, all kind of weird noises and I became aware of pain. A lot of pain. The first words I said were, I'm missing teeth, and opened my eyes. I was laying on my back on the sidewalk, surrounded by people that I didn't know, a lot of them freaking out. I was completely confused. At some point, a cop scooped me up, kind of dragged me across the sidewalk in grass, and threw me face down in the back of a cop car. I was still really confused. I was taken to the hospital by the cop and given CT scans and tests. I went through about three years of horrid depression. I was grieving the loss of my wife and children and dealing with the knowledge that they never existed. I was scared that I was going insane as I would cry myself to sleep, hoping I would see her in my dreams. I never have. But sometimes, I see my son, usually just a glimpse out of my peripheral vision. He's perpetually five years old, and I can never hear what he says. 
My husband recently took an overnight job to help us out during COVID. He's only been there about two weeks and works overnights, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Last night was no different. He left home around 8.15. Our daughter, who's 11, and I decided to make it a movie night. Around 11, I heard keys in my back door and the usual sounds my husband makes when he comes home. I creep out to the kitchen to make sure it was him, and it was. He told me he needed to grab his knee compression sleeve. Walks down the hall, says hi to our daughter as he passes the living room, and goes upstairs. He comes back down, gave me a kiss, and left again. We finished our movie and went to bed. In the morning when he got home, I made a joking comment about him forgetting his knee sleeve. He was genuinely confused, as I recalled the previous night. Our daughter confirmed everything I said, and he still was acting confused. I pulled up our security motion camera on my phone to show him when he popped in real quick. But there was no footage from the night before or any other night of him coming home after he's left for work. My daughter and I both heard him, saw him, and I kissed him but he was never home during that time. Nothing else out of the ordinary happened that night. We seriously have no idea what happened. This happened yesterday and it still makes me uncomfortable. I was at the train station on my way back from work when I saw a couple. What drew my attention was the fact that they were speaking my language. So I looked at them. The woman was built and looked exactly like me, and I do not have a common appearance for the country I live in. But she was about a decade older, and the man was an aged carbon copy of my current boyfriend. But what really set my creepy radar off was the following. She had the tattoo I always wanted to get, exactly where I wanted to get it. It's a very personal design only my best friend knows about, so it's not a common tattoo. He was speaking my native language with a very distinctive accent. So I looked at them when they were facing the other way, feeling extremely creeped out. It was then that the woman turned around and saw me, freezing instantly as if she'd seen a ghost. Then I finally managed to look away and run towards the exit. I really feel like I'm going insane here. It was as if she, I, remembered that exact moment and knew exactly when and where to look for me. I didn't tell anyone about this because I don't want them to think that I'm completely nuts. So before we start, some background. I have a group of friends who've been friends pretty much since kindergarten. There's four of us, which means me and three more guys, and we were all in our late 20s at the time this happened. We are all really close, even though ever since college, we meet up very rarely. All of us were in long-lasting and steady relationships, either married or living together. Except for the main subject in this story, who just come out of a pretty messy divorce. This friend, who's named Andy, had been having a really rough time of his life as his ex-wife decided to leave him right as his mother was dying of cancer. So it was understandable that we were all a little bit worried about him. One of my friends has a pretty nice country house that's away from civilization enough to allow for a nice weekend retreat every once in a while. And at the start of this story, we had one of those scheduled. The week before, as we were all planning our retreat, Andy decided that he wasn't going because he didn't want to be the only one without a significant other for the entire weekend. We all insisted a little bit, but we kind of understood the feeling, and since he had another event to go to during the weekend, we left it alone. Still, I wasn't really satisfied with that as I felt he could really use the change of scenery. So I decided that I'd give him a call Saturday morning right before I left the country house, offering him a ride and giving him one last chance to show up. I called him from the door of my house, and he sounded kind of weird on the phone, like he was sluggish or something. I even joked with him about it, since it was kind of early on Saturday, and so I assumed I'd woken him up. He didn't laugh or anything, so I thought he was pissed off. When I offered to pick him up and give him a ride, he simply replied, Okay. 
I told him to pack up a change of clothes and meet me in front of his house, and so we were off. It was me, the wife, and Andy in the car for a nice 45-minute drive. I started noticing things were off just as he got into the car. He was acting really slow. I have no other way to put this. He didn't get any jokes. He had trouble understanding simple questions and just kept replying either with a simple yes or no or with a really slurred short phrase at the most. At this point, me and the wife had reason to be worried about him. We started thinking maybe he'd developed some weird form of depression or started doing drugs. He refused to acknowledge anything was wrong with him, and so we simply drove on, hoping maybe he'd open up later on. So we all arrived. There was food, drinks, video games, and since we'd all been friends for over 20 years, lots of fun was to be had. It quickly became obvious to all of us that Andy was not all right. He wasn't playing any games, wasn't talking at all, and he spent most of his time just looking at us or at the outside. He'd have a look of marvel on his face, as if he was watching something really impressive unfolding. As time went on, I noticed he wasn't eating or drinking anything at all. And one of the guys swears that he kept tabs, and Andy never went to the bathroom even once for the entire stay. We tried to get him to talk, but he just gave the exact same response every time. I'm okay. He ended up winning the patience game, and so we just left him to his own devices. The night went on. He sat on a bench outside, looking at a stretch of woods near the house. We stayed indoors talking and stuff, and then we decided to go to sleep. Andy said he'd go soon. He just wanted to chill for a little bit outside, and we all let him be. The next morning, which was late Sunday morning, his bed had never been made. The sheets were still intact on top of it. Andy was sitting outside in the exact same place we left him in the exact same position. That was it. I was completely freaked out and decided it was time to go back home. We packed our stuff, said our goodbyes, and everyone was really worried about him. But we all felt generally creeped out. So we just called it a weekend and left. I drove him home, dropped him off, and went home myself. Later that night, we ended up all meeting each other again in a restaurant for a birthday and get-together of a common friend. I noticed Andy was himself again, and my two other friends looked really puzzled. So I sat down and asked him, what happened yesterday, man? He replied something like, yeah, my car broke down, and Peter had to pick me up in the middle of the night after the bar. Well, that made no sense. And so we all started asking questions and trying to piece it all together. Turns out he was at the bar with a couple of the other guys at the same time he was with us at the country house. When we kept insisting in a kind of panic that that was impossible, multiple people showed us pictures of him at the event. There were effing pictures. So we all freaked out. And noticing that we weren't joking, Andy freaked out as well. We confirmed via his phone history that his phone, in fact, got my call Saturday morning, but he doesn't remember answering it. After this, the talk did continue, but we really couldn't get anywhere, and that was it. As the months passed by, the three of us all got really afraid of Andy and who he could be. We still have no idea of who was with us at the house, And Andy has gotten really sick of hearing about this, to the point of getting really mad when the subject comes up. He says the most rational explanation is we all got confused and thought this up. I'm still nervous about that to this day, especially because I dropped him off at his house and saw him enter. Where did fake Andy go? Did he do anything while we were all asleep? I've asked around and nothing really fits. I'm not really a believer in paranormal things, but I have no other explanations. I'm a married woman who lives in a farmhouse with my husband, aunt, and four children. 
my daughter had gone to a birthday celebration about 45 minutes away in the next town over. The next day, I'd planned to take her with me to buy some livestock to start my business. Around 10 in the evening, I got ready for bed. My husband had already went to bed about 20 minutes or so ahead of me. By the time I got in the bed, he was snoring as he usually goes off to sleep as soon as his head hits the pillow. I am not so lucky, and it takes me a while to fall asleep. I lay in the bed thinking about how the day was going to go off tomorrow. I'd say I'd been in the bed five minutes. Then the door opened up to my room. The hall light was on, and I could see clearly that it was my daughter, Jessica. She must have gotten back from the party, I thought. She stood in the doorway for a while, staring at me. She was a solid form, just like anybody is, and not like a ghost. But I found it odd that she wasn't speaking to me, and had a hint of bluishness in her face. But I thought it was just the darkness of my room reflecting on her complexion. She had a bland expression on her face, but her eyes were wide, just staring. I said, it's late, you better get some sleep, we have a big day tomorrow. She responded and said, I know and closed the door and left. Then as I lay thinking, I thought there were a few more things I wanted to say to her before she went to bed. I got up right away, only to find that she was nowhere in the house. At that point, I was really angry, thinking that she'd gone out again. I called her cell number, and she picked up, surprised by my anger. She insisted that she'd never been home and was still at the birthday party. I didn't believe her and asked to speak with Mrs. Davis, who's the mother of the child having the party in her home. She came on the cell and confirmed that Jessica was there and had been there the entire evening. I asked Mrs. Davis if I could talk to her on her home landline phone, so immediately I called their landline and Jessica picked up. I was floored. How could it be? She was for certain, no doubt, in a town 45 minutes away yet I saw her in my bedroom doorway no more than ten minutes earlier. It's a complete impossibility. I could not explain it. I work at a gas station chain with only numbers in its name. We're just outside of a large chunk of suburbs, none of that middle-of-nowhere business. Like, we aren't exactly near any other businesses, but we are rarely completely dead for hours at a time. It was just past midnight, and with COVID, not a lot of things other than gas stations and bars are open at night anymore. So it was a slower evening. I was the only one in the store, and a car pulled up to one of the two double-sided pumps out front. Pretty standard white four-door. I'm not great with car brands, but it was a little nicer, like upper middle class and probably only a few years old. A woman gets out and starts walking toward our door like she's in a daze. Legit, this woman looked like she saw a ghost. She wanders up, sort of freezes at the door for a second with a thousand-yard stare before opening it and coming in. She didn't go looking for anything and didn't start shopping. She just kind of stood inside for what felt like ages. Again, bars are still open, so I think maybe she's a little drunk or had a rough night or something. So I give the usual, welcome, let me know if you need any help finding anything. And she finally notices me and immediately asks me the weirdest damn question I've ever been asked on the job. You can see me, right? Yeah, like, what else do you say? Then she breaks down crying in the middle of my store, so I'm already headed around the corner to see what's up. I have my cell phone out in case I need to call the cops or something for her. I get her to sit down on a nearby pallet of soda, and as I'm grabbing her a bottle of water, she catches her breath a little and she tells me, I thought I had died. Again, I'm thinking maybe she's on something, but she's a middle-aged woman who looks like a standard local suburban housewife. We're a pretty boring town without the drugs like you find closer to the cities. So she asks if I can call her husband to pick her up and wait with me. She has her own phone and does so, not really telling him either, just where she is and if he can come get her. He says he'll call an Uber and be here as soon as he can. 
So we're waiting and so far no one else has showed up. So I'm mostly keeping my attention on her and eventually she starts explaining to me. I was driving home from dinner with my coworkers and as I'm driving through the intersection, a truck ran a red light and hit me. Now, her car is still at the pump without a scratch on it. She goes on to say she remembers her car being pushed into a pole, going airborne, and then nothing. I try to calm her down, letting her know that her car is out front and it looks fine. But she insisted that she completely blacked out, woke up in an ambulance for a split second, then passed out again, and woke up again in the driver's seat of her car at the intersection waiting for the light to change. Perfectly fine. This whole thing freaked her out so badly that she drove to the nearest anything, which was us, just so she could get out of her car. Her husband eventually showed up to get her. He asked if I had any idea what happened, and even though she sort of explained it to me, I just shrugged because, no, I still really had no idea what was happening. She reluctantly got into the passenger seat of the car, and he drove them back home. That was hours ago after which I worked an entire shift to the station trying to wrap my head around what the absolute hell I had just witnessed. This Wednesday on the way to work, I went to my usual gas station. I go there every day, five days a week. I go in and everything's different. All new drink stations have been installed and the food area is completely redone. None of this was different Tuesday morning, and I couldn't believe that they'd reach on a gas station in one night. I then go outside and see that two gas pumps are completely gone, and there are bags of mulch stacked, taking up all the space. None of this was there the day before. I then leave and head to work and somehow turn on the wrong street and get lost. I've been driving these neighborhoods for months, and suddenly I'm lost trying to find my job. I get to work a few minutes later and I'm panicking. I know it's silly, but I've always feared changing timelines. My fiance and I have a timeline safe word, so we know we're together. I call and ask him and he has no idea what I'm talking about. We just talked about it at the end of January and we've had it established for a while. I've even woken him up at night and asked him after having a nightmare and he's known the password. But now he has no idea what I'm talking about. Then the girls start coming downstairs. I work in an addictions group home. And one girl keeps saying how confused she is and how nothing makes sense today. Later in the day, another kept saying all she wanted to do was cry and she had no idea why. Then while running errands, I go down the same street I always do. And suddenly, there are four houses gone and a grove of trees planted. I've never seen them before, and I really started freaking out. They're next to a building my family owned for the last 20 years. I know this whole neighborhood. My final straw was calling my mom today. She said my sister was going out tonight with her friend, Jenna. I've known Jenna since 2003. I asked how much longer until Jenna has her baby. My mom goes silent and asks what the heck I'm talking about. She says she's never been pregnant. I look her up online and nothing. I asked my sister just a half hour ago and she laughs in my face and says Jenna is infertile and will never have kids. I literally remember the day my sister told me she was pregnant. She told me to guess who and Jenna was my third guess. What the hell is happening to my life? About the safe word and the things leading up to the day, we created the safe word mostly as a joke after I read the Berenstein Bears theory, and I had a really weird day at my old job. It became more used when I'd have nightmares and when I made jokes. I've since followed up with my doctor and taken some psych exams, but all is fine. Okay, y'all, those are today's Glitch in the Matrix stories. Let's go over the possible causes for these experiences before we move on to the final thoughts. So what on earth could potentially be the cause for these experiences? The common ideological thread amongst these stories, as well as those from the last episode, is multiverse theory. Put very simply, 
It's the idea that we have multiple parallel universes that run alongside one another, with infinite versions of ourselves placed into each one of them. It's more a philosophical rather than a scientific theory. Largely, the scientific community feels like it isn't disprovable enough to spend a large amount of time and money studying it, along with potentially reducing people's trust and belief in science for such an abstract concept. So many of these stories involve someone seeming to experience their own death. Another philosophical theory, quantum immortality, is said to potentially be at play here. Now, to be honest, it's a very difficult theory for me to understand, and it's even more difficult for me to try to relay it to anyone else. But from what I understand, in essence, there are infinite universes, each with one of you in them. Therefore, there are infinite versions of you. The term immortality is used because if there are infinite versions of you, then you never truly die, even if you aren't aware of the other versions. The belief is that these glitches, so to speak, are a glimpse of one of your other selves, where the outcome was very close to the one you're experiencing, only altered just a little bit. The other competing, reigning theory on these glitches is simulation theory. You've undoubtedly heard this theory voiced many times before, that as people, we are living in a simulation, and we don't realize it. We are essentially the Sims, and our controller is who we view as God. Another unprovable theory is it's considered that our technology is not yet advanced enough to be able to recognize and prove the simulation. In the case of the friend Andy and the daughter who went to the party, both being in two places at the same time somehow, the collective idea behind this is the idea of bilocation. Bilocation is said to be a psychic or miraculous ability typically rooted in various religions. Numerous saints, gurus, prophets, and other religious figures are said to use bilocation to appear in two places at once, often for people in need or to appear as symbols or figureheads. Amongst everyday people, it's considered a more psychic phenomenon, where someone can seemingly project themselves into another place, but the projection gets a limited amount of energy keeping their interactions very rudimentary. These explanations aren't exactly the sort of logical solution that makes everything make sense, but in the realm of the unexplained and paranormal, short of explaining everything away as mental illness, any theories out there just aren't going to be very grounded. All right, now that we've heard the stories and the leading theories, now let's talk about it. I just had to do a two-part episode for this one. It was mostly unplanned, but this stuff is so intriguing, and I love that every story gives a different sense of mystery because no two are the same, and they may all have a common thread, but they're also varied and so interesting. The story about the earring falling from the sky, out of nowhere, onto the guy's chest, The paranormal junkie in me wants to believe her mom was looking out for her. That she knew how upset her daughter was to lose the earring and how much it meant, so she was lending a helping hand by returning it. The man who crossed the street and did the gotcha rather than looking at his phone? I feel like it's possible, although I don't know how likely, that if he's wearing Bluetooth earbuds, it's possible they somehow connected to the Bluetooth in the car so that he heard the conversation. Although I feel more inclined to believe that simply the guy could read lips and he saw the man talking to his daughter in the car. That seems like the obvious solution to me. The person who was beat up by the football player and lived an entire life while unconscious is such a sad story. Imagine grieving a family you never actually had but felt it that vividly. And it's so hard to decide if I feel he did have an instance of crossing into another universe and experiencing another of his actual lives, or if it was simply a hallucination brought on from the assumed concussion that he had. The latter seems much more likely and obvious, but if it was just a hallucination, is seeing his son from his peripheral vision an ongoing remnant of that? Or is it just his imagination? Either way, this story is really heartbreaking. 
the story where the woman's husband came home for his knee brace and her and her daughter both saw and actually touched him. And then on the camera later, they saw nothing. How do you explain that? It isn't even under the umbrella of bilocation because he wasn't there. It's almost like they both hallucinated it, but that's just too unlikely to happen. The woman who saw what seemed to be an older version of herself and her boyfriend, I imagine the woman looked at her shocked that way because she looks so much like her. Although that doesn't explain the tattoo. I've heard enough similar stories to this where people have actually seen their past, present, or future selves within a glitch. Do we think that's what happened here? She certainly seems to think so. I hope that she takes note and manages to keep up with time so that she goes back to that train station on that day in the future to see what happens. Because it's really interesting to think that she could be on the other side of it next time. The final story about everything being different for that person who works in the addictions facility, I want to know if the following day everything was back to normal or if it stayed altered like that. I feel like I can't even speculate without knowing that very important information. I do know having a timeline safe word is not something the average person does. And inevitably, the more you expect an unexplainable event, the more likely you are to feel like you're experiencing one. All of the near-death experiences or where people witness their own death, only it didn't actually happen, could easily be argued as some sort of divine intervention for those who are religious at all. Outside of that explanation, one could argue that someone is glimpsing across the universes into a very similar one where the car crash does occur or the armoire does come crashing down. Speaking of the armoire, I wish the original writer had elaborated on how he woke up in the dining room to the phone ringing and being asked to move the furniture. I'm assuming that he hadn't meant to take a nap in the dining room, that he just woke up there abruptly without explanation. I wish I knew a little more about that. My favorite stories among this bunch are definitely the bilocation stories. The story of Andy with his friends at the party, acting strangely, barely speaking. Their concern for him, and then to find out he was somewhere else the entire night with actual photos as proof. It blows my mind. As far as the bilocation theory, I don't know if I buy it or not. I suppose I could say that I don't. But the stories are just so out there. How else could any of this be explained? So for lack of better reasoning, I feel like the idea is the only thing that could maybe make sense. It's so abstract, I just don't even know. The similar story with the woman's daughter, Jessica, going to a party then being seen at home later is also jarring, but less dramatic than Andy's, since the sighting of her was relatively brief. Also, her mom was in bed even if just for a couple minutes when she spotted Jessica. Even if she was awake, there's that liminal space between wakefulness and sleep. And in my experience, incredible things can happen in that small window. On the flip side, sometimes perceptions also can't be well-trusted in that space. As always, I want to know what you think. Reach out to me on social media at Obscure Appalachia or send me an email at ObscureAppalachia at gmail.com. I love to hear from you guys. As a reminder, if you need content warnings for each episode, you can always find those in the show notes. If you'd like to support the podcast and get bonus episodes, you can do that at Patreon.com slash ObscureAppalachia. A big thank you as always goes out to my patrons for all of your support, as well as each one of my listeners. Until next time. <music>